And now it's time for some English. I want to introduce you to an oxymoron. Oxymorons are basically a pairs of words. When held together, they each have a totally opposite meaning. Like clearly misunderstood or cruel kindness or good grief. How can grief be good, right? But it's used together. Good grief, this happened kind of thing. Or larger half. How can one half be larger? Then you have some people saying, I need the original copy of this. How can you have an original copy, right? She's terribly good. Terribly and good are like totally opposite, but this makes sense. And then there's one which doesn't. This old man is a wise fool. She gave a silent scream. This joke is seriously funny. Serious, funny, two opposite meaning words brought together to give some meaning. These are oxymorons. In biology too, uh, there is one weird oxymoron. Food poisoning. Food is essential for survival. How can it poison you then? Is it possible? Food poisoning? Yes, it's possible. Could be due to the consumption of food spoiled by some microorganisms. Microorganisms that grow on our food sometimes produce toxic substances. And these toxic substances can have effects ranging from a small, tiny stomachache to death. And there are two very well-known causes of food poisoning, Salmonella and Escherichia coli, called E. coli. Now, Salmonella is usually found in chickens and eggs uh, that have been contaminated and that anything that has been, you know, made using these contaminated chicken or eggs. Now, E. coli is a surprise because it actually lives in your large intestine and doesn't do you any harm. It's in fact a good bacteria. But if E. coli gets into any other part of your body, it can cause a lot of a problem. The most common reason people get sick from E. coli is because they drink water or eat food that has been washed in water that has untreated sewage in it. So E. coli is a good bacteria gone bad because it was just in the wrong place. So if you leave food out in the open, it will begin to rot. This is because bacteria likes tasty food too, like you, and will eat the food that you have left out and make lots more bacteria in the process. You have to be very, very careful, store food correctly. Because if you eat food that contains bad bacteria, you will get food poisoning, which can make you very, very ill. You cannot always tell if your food does contain bacteria of course you know it smells really bad looks a little yucky but sometimes though things can look a little less than perfect they may be okay to eat like if a banana skin has spots on it or a slice of apple cut out goes a little bit brown because it's left out in the air they're all perfectly safe to have you won't get sick so good hygiene when you're buying storing, preparing, cooking, eating, food will make sure that you avoid getting bacteria on your food. Any small amount that does make it will be killed when you cook your food well. So it's also important to check the labels on the food cans before eating when you buy from the stores to make sure that the expiry date has not passed. And also important to try and preserve food for as long as we possibly can. So I'm sure you're thinking of one solution refrigerators refrigeration because when you refrigerate food you lower the temperature that's what you basically do right you inhibit the growth of microbes but refrigerating food is just one option and it may not be the best option each time so whether you believe it or not it is possible to live without refrigeration and long before the advent of home coolers and freezers the problems of food storage and preservation had actually been solved but this invaluable knowledge has been largely forgotten by our modern society and there is a negative too because the frozen food or refrigerated food uh, doesn't last for longer than three months. It loses its flavor, appearance and large portion of its nutritional values. And some edible food becomes actually horrible to taste. And so what if there's a power failure, right? A long, really long power failure. What would you do? You cannot use refrigeration. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back in time. A time when there was no refrigerator, the time of our grandparents. So let's spend one day in their village with no electricity. Yes, it is possible to survive without electricity and we are going to understand how. The only thing you're going to take along with you is this Samsung tablet. You will fall asleep now and when you get up, you find yourself in your ancestral home. There is no TV, no jazzy smartphones. You find yourself in a charming remote village completely in tune with nature. It's early in the morning and you can hear 
the sound of birds chirping outside. You get the nice smell of homemade parathas and pickle. Mm, while you eat that paratha and pickle, you wonder, how can pickle be kept for so long? You had the same yummy mango pickle last month. Grandma does this by pickling the pickle. What is pickling? Pickling is nothing but a process of preserving food in a very high acid solution, either by adding vinegar or naturally by means of something called fermentation. So microbes that spoil the food cannot grow in this high acid environment. So you achieve the state in two ways, by means of salt, and by using vinegar. And when you use vinegar, you need to use salt as well. So salt is the main ingredient here in pickling. So pickling with salt actually falls into two categories. One is dry salt and one is brined salt. Uh, the dry salt method, uh, you just combine dry salt with vegetables in quantities above just what you will add for seasoning. So that keeps it good going for some time. And now if you talk about the pickle, the liquid juices from the vegetables is pulled out and this liquid combined with salt is what we call brine, a salty, watery solution. And uh, when this pre-made brine is made, the vegetable is placed in a combination of salt and water inside this brine. In both cases, the vegetables are going to be covered in brine for some amount of time and in the submerged, airless state below the brine, the vegetables ferment. And what is that? Nothing but a process by which the natural good bacteria in the food converts the sugar into something called lactic acid. Lactic acid is a natural preservative. So depending on the strength, microorganisms will not grow in lactic acid because it's an acid. Now pickling with vinegar is actually a much quicker process than pickling with salt. In vinegar pickling, the vegetable does not ferment. It's just rested for a short time in brine and it's brought to boil in vinegar solution, packed into jars and then kept and uh, preserved for a long time. Vinegar is nothing but acetic acid. So acetic acid brings up the acidity of the solution to a point where microorganisms cannot live in it. So acetic acid, by the way, is flavorless and it's colorless. Also, there is this oil in the pickle, okay, which you may see as a layer floating around. Is that important? Yes, it is. It prevents the spoilage because harmful microbes cannot live in this oily environment. Now, I'll ask you a question that you might have actually encountered. You never put a wet spoon into a pickle jar, right? Mom never allows you to do that. Why? Because this will add moisture to the pickle and then one microbe which loves the wet and the damp. Which one is it? Fungus will tend to start growing and then it will spoil the pickle. You take a walk by the lake and you pass by the fish market and then you see the fishmonger covering some of the fish with dry salt. This is also called salting and is used to preserve fish and meat for a longer time because salt will prevent the growth of microbes. Salting is also used to preserve amla, raw mangoes, and tamarind as well. You are now tired from the long walk that you took and you take out the lunch basket that grandma has actually packed for you. You will find some chapatis with jam and vegetable curry and you will also find a glass of orange squash. Jams, jelly, squashes are all preserved by sugar. Why sugar? Because sugar reduces the moisture content and if moisture content is reduced, growth of bacteria and fungus is reduced. And this is called preservation by using sugar. And as an additional point, sodium benzoate and sodium meta bisulfite are also commonly used preservatives. They are used in jams and squashes as well to check their spoilage. This is called the chemical method because you are using chemicals. You appreciate your lunch and start the journey back home. You pass by some ladies drying chilies, rice husk, dry fish in the sun. This helps preserve them longer. Fish pickle can actually be made this way with dry fish. And this process of preservation of drying is called dehydrating. Meats can also be hung out in this way in the sunshine. You pass by large paddy fields and you see farmers drying hay in the sun for their cows to feed on. You enter a cow shed 
and collect some milk in a milk can and you take it back home you are thirsty and you want to have that milk immediately straight from the can but grandma says no stop you cannot do that it has to be boiled why grandma you ask because the milk may contain some microbes they need to be killed before you consume the milk so grandma put the milk in a clay pot on some firewood that she lights up by rubbing two sticks together and now the milk has boiled and is safe to have because boiling has killed the microorganisms the milk packets that you get nowadays are sterilized already by pasteurization pasteurized milk can be consumed without boiling as it's free from harmful microbes so what happens here the milk is heated to a high temperature around 70 degrees for 15 to 13 seconds and then suddenly chilled and stored uh, what a different sounding name right pasteurization it's actually in honor of the scientist who invented the process louis pasteur It's time to have supper with grandma you listen to her stories you drift off to sleep one relaxing day at a village one fruitful day learning every type of preservation to keep fruit fresh and tasty as long as you possibly can and finally it's time to talk about one important cycle of nature the cycle that circulates one very important gas that forms 78% of the atmosphere to the earth and back to the air and when it's on earth this gas does a lot of help to us keeps life going and plays an important role in so many of its processes and when i'm talking about the nitrogen cycle we are talking about how nitrogen basically cycles around in the environment the nitrogen cycle represents one of the most important nutrient cycles found in the terrestrial ecosystem nitrogen is used by living organisms to produce a number of complex organic molecules like amino acids proteins and nucleic acids the store of nitrogen is found in the atmosphere while it exists as gas mainly as n2 something that you already know plays an important role for all of life on this planet this store is about 1 million times larger than the total nitrogen contained in all living organisms other major stores of nitrogen include organic matter in the soil and in the oceans despite its abundance in the atmosphere nitrogen is often the most limiting nutrient for plant growth this problem occurs because most plants can take up nitrogen in only two solid forms ammonium ions which is nh4 plus ions and nitrate ions which is no3 minus ions most plants obtain nitrogen they need as inorganic nitrates from the soil ammonia is used less by plants for uptake because in large concentrations ammonia becomes extremely toxic animals receive the required nitrogen they need for metabolism growth and reproduction by the consumption of living or dead organic matter containing molecules composed partially of nitrogen the main components of the nitrogen cycle starts with the element nitrogen in the air the two nitrogen oxides can be formed uh, as a result of interaction of nitrogen with the oxygen the nitrogen will react with oxygen only in the presence of high temperatures and pressures that are found near the lightning bolts and in combustion reactions in powerful plants or internal combustion engines the nitric oxide that is no and nitrous nitrogen dioxide no2 are formed under these conditions eventually nitrogen dioxide may react with water in the rain to form nitric acid the nitrates thus formed may be utilized by plants as nutrients the nitrogen in the air becomes a part of the biological matter mostly through the action of bacteria and algae in a process known as nitrogen fixation legume plants such as clover alfalfa and soya beans from the nodules of the roots where nitrogen fixing bacteria take nitrogen from the air and convert it into ammonia that's nh3 the ammonia is further converted by other bacteria into nitrate ions which is no2 minus and then finally nitrate ions plants utilize the nitrate ions as a nutrient or fertilizer for growth nitrogen is incorporated in many amino acids which basically react further to make proteins ammonia can also be made through a synthetic process known as the haber's process 
nitrogen and hydrogen are reacted under great pressures and temperatures in the presence of a catalyst to make ammonia ammonia may be directly applied to farm fields as fertilizers ammonia may be further processed with oxygen to make nitric acid the reaction of ammonia and nitric acid produces ammonium nitrate which may be then used as a fertilizer animal waste when decomposed also returns to the earth as nitrates to complete the cycle other bacteria in the soil carry out a process known as denitrification which converts nitrates back to the nitrogen gas a side product of this reaction is the production of a gas known as nitrous oxide or no2 nitrous oxide also known as the laughing gas acts as a mild anesthetic it is also a greenhouse gas which contributes to the global warming scenario so let's quickly summarize what we learned today we learned that microorganisms are the oldest relatives that we could possibly have and that they have made life on earth possible for us today while 95% of them are nice and beneficial to us and in fact help us be alive there are a trouble some 5% that cause a lot of diseases the main diseases affecting us humans what they do who cause them can be summarized in an important examination point of view table like this tuberculosis is formed by bacteria it spread through the air measles is caused by virus again it spread through the air then you have chickenpox which is also caused by a virus which can spread if you know if you touch the person who has it or even through air and then you have polio which is also caused by a virus and it's also spread again through air or water so there are vaccines available for all of these but then you need to keep the person who has it in isolation and then you have cholera and typhoid both which are caused by bacteria and they spread through the water so for this you need to consume good drinking water and not allow water to accumulate around you and then you have hepatitis b which is again caused by a virus and it spread through water and finally there is malaria which is caused by a protozoan spread by a mosquito and this is one uh, one disease that you would not want to get so to keep the mosquitoes at bay you need to avoid water longing in regions around you and then you have the trouble makers for plants as well you have citrus canker which is caused by a bacteria and it spreads through air and then you have uh, the rust of wheat which we spoke about which is caused by a fungus again it spreads through air and water uh, air and seeds and then finally you have the okra plant the mosaic vein of okra which is caused by a virus and again it spreads and in this case it spreads through a white fly which is an insect which acts as a carrier and transfers the virus from one plant to the other the good guys 95% of them help us out with their everything like anything some of them live inside us mostly in our gut and they break down our food matter and they keep our digestive system nice and healthy and then some of them are edible like mushrooms and some of them can cook like bacteria which make curd possible and yeast which makes bread and wine possible through a process called fermentation and fermentation was also invented by louis pasteur in 1857 the same person who invented the process of pasteurization antibiotics has made the life expectancy of people go up a lot since earlier days and it was alexander fleming who first found the way antibiotics work and penicillin was the first wonder antibiotic that was used to treat many bacterial infections when you are vaccinating someone you are basically fooling the immune system into believing that there is danger ahead but then this is very very useful because our immune system has a superb memory and when the actual disease hits it is ready and it will attack it and defeat it completely in style which makes vaccination a very very important type of prevention for so many diseases food poisoning is possible when bad bacteria and bad fungi go really bad 
and release deadly toxins that can even kill us. So preservation becomes really, really important. We can preserve by salting, pickling, using sugar, dehydrating, using oil, using vinegar, using chemicals and also by boiling and pasteurization. And then there is this awesome bacteria that helps fix the nitrogen in the air and then uses it to decompose, make a lot of life on earth actually possible.